Right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the kind of bigger picture of what happened uh, with mobile phone apps in the last 10 years or so. Um, and I was kind of surprised uh, when Golan asked me to do a history, because usually I'm invited uh, to speak about all the cool new stuff people do with their mobile phones and apps. And now I'm invited to do something about the history. <laughs> So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, development that now suddenly we have, like, we have a history, yes, good. Um, so, and actually, um, 2001, when I first met Golan at the Ars Electronica uh, in, in Linz, and I saw his telesymphony, and there were a couple of other pieces that were using mobile phones, some of which I'm going to show later, that was really when I first got interested in this kind of area. Um, and I started to look um, at artists and musicians and designers using mobile phones for all sorts of creative uh, and arts projects. And uh, I must say, in the first few years, I really had to look very hard, and I had to do a lot of research because there weren't many around then. Um, nevertheless, um, I did kind of start to build up an archive of all sorts of different works. I tried to go and see as many of them as I could and I tried to save as many documentation as I could. Because unfortunately, a lot of these projects are kind of one-off projects, or they are, you know, like, happen once at some weird arts festival at the other end of the world, so maybe three people go and see it, and then it kind of disappears. Um, so I'm trying to keep track of what happens. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happened that I didn't keep track of, so if anyone has any other ideas of projects, always appreciate it, send them to me. Um, nevertheless, between kind of 1998 and um, 2000, um, 2006, um, I kind of documented around about 300 projects that used mobile phones um, for audience interaction uh, in, in art. Um, and since then, it's kind of exploded, and there are probably thousands of projects around now. Um, but um, I want to kind of not just show what's been done because I don't want to bore you with, uh, I don't know how many hundred projects, but I want to kind of dig a little bit deeper and ask what are kind of the themes behind that and that people have been engaging with. Um, to start with, because we're talking about kind of 10 year time frame here, I would like to ask my computer, wants to, uh, what is a mobile phone? So what is a mobile phone today is obviously very different to what a mobile phone was 10 years ago, we all know that. We don't have any of these anymore. We don't have any of these or those. Um, that one's in the bin. That one's maybe we took it out of the bin again because it's quite cool. We don't have any of those. <laughs> that one's gone. This one is in the phone now as well. That one, that one as well. Uh, this one, we don't even know what it is anymore. And uh, we don't even need this one anymore. We can just use the screen of the phone to find out. <laughs> Lots of things disappeared, but. You know, that's now. Ten years ago, you still had to have most of these objects in your bag, um, which tended to be quite a big bag. Um, but I'm just going to say that I'm not going to talk about projects that used any of these, like PDAs or any other kind of devices that were not in telephones back then. So that's kind of the restriction I put onto myself. Um, so, yes. Reminder of what we used to have and what I'm not going to talk about but also the kind of convergence of all these different media, um, mobile media, into the mobile phone uh, also spurred on some, some ideas uh, for art projects and um, I have some, some quite funny ones and some nice ones I'm going to show you. Um, so kind of thinking, you know, what else we could integrate into the mobile phone or, you know, how could, how could that work? So uh, here's an old school project that uh, Tristan did in 2004. So he just got one of those really old phones and put his mobile phone into that phone. So then he had to carry around this old device. Uh, a couple of other ones were Somo in 2003 by Ideao. They did a whole load of them. One was like a trumpet. You had to play the trumpet to make a phone call. And the cactus phone has kind of spiky, um, spiky keys. So every time you make a phone call, you have pain. Um, then another one uh, which I find really nice is this uh, 89 project, the iron phone uh, by Ela. So he kind of hacked um, an iron and put his mobile phone inside. Um, and uh, I couldn't quite figure out if it actually heats up as well. Maybe the longer you talk or something like that. I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but a nice one, um, you know. Yeah. 
some serious device to carry around with you. There's some nice footage online for this one, surprisingly. Um, and there's another one uh, which is called Telephone Boxing, and that kind of takes out the interface of dialing and distributes it in the room, and you have to box those pads to, to dial a number, um, which, you know, again, kind of um, takes the kind of the more hardware device approach and explodes it out of the space, which is quite interesting. Um, another one, what the phone could be, is this isophone, it's done in 2004. And uh, basically, the phone is distributed in these uh, four different uh, capsules. And the, it's a helmet you wear, and it keeps you afloat as well. So this guy is not standing, but he's floating, being held up by the helmet. And the idea is that you're so relaxed, and you're feeling so good, that all your brain capacity is then free to concentrate on making a phone call. <laughs> Which is obviously the opposite of what we usually do, because we usually do all sorts of other things. And, you know, maybe not spend that, pay that much attention to what the other person is saying on the line. Um, right, so this kind of brings me also to one of my uh, next group of projects. Um, this is uh, obviously a quite intimate device, big helmet on your head, and you're kind of very confronted with your, with your body while making a phone call. And that's also a big theme, obviously, that the mobile phone has, you know, the phone in general has moved closer and closer to the body, so, you know, it's gone off the wall, into the living room, going mobile, and now in our pockets and our hands all the time. We want to touch it, we want to check it, we you know, want to make sure it's there. Um, you know, most people sleep with it, most people never switch it off. Um, and there have been some interesting projects as well, kind of playing with the intimacy of technology, and we, especially in the early days, you know, there was a kind of uh, reminiscence of those kind of cyborg debates and what happens when technology enters the body and those kind of things. So uh, one project in 99 was a vibrating internal pager, so that was actually uh, working with a pager or text messaging later on. And you can imagine what it does. Um, you want, might want to think very carefully who you give your number to, because every time you get a message from that person, you're going to have an internal um, alert. <laughs> So, um, very interesting project, that one. Um, and the other one on here, self sensor by Mark Bain, is a project where he was wearing the contact microphones on his body, so if people would call up, they could hear the different sounds of his body. Um, I don't know if you actually want to hear that, but um, never mind, it was also dealing with the kind of intimacy of having the phone very close to your body. Um, and, oh yeah, there's another one here. So this is an audio tooth implant, so you can have uh, this implanted in your tooth, and um, it uh, uses, um, it's, it's, uh, what's it called, it vibrates, and then via the, the bones of your, uh, of your skull, it transmits the sound. So if you use your uh, iPod or your, no, I don't know, that was before iPods, but if you use your mobile phone or other mobile devices, you can actually listen to the sound from your tooth which would be transmitted uh, wirelessly to your tooth. So this is kind of more invasive, maybe, than the other ones. So um, another question um, I would like to, to ask is, you know, so far we've kind of looked at the devices and how, how <coughs> we've been dealing with the devices and the closeness to the body. Um, but another thing really to keep in mind with mobile phones, um, this one was working with uh, monitoring the heartbeat of people and then that would be transmitted uh, to a mobile phone and then that would be transmitted into an installation where the data was used uh, to have a performance with a choir uh, but also to have an installation with buckets and water in the buckets and they would be churned depending on the heartbeat of people so if they would all start to run around they you know, it would be very noisy in there. And if people were sleeping, it would be a very quiet installation. And that was in 2000, so that was kind of uh, fairly early to be dealing with all these kind of complex things. Um, but um, next one is to think about, you know, what is kind of behind uh, all these neat little devices that we use. And, you know, there's a whole load of infrastructure behind it that. I think a lot of the time is not really addressed in, in many artworks. So we need power. We usually only realize when we run out of power, for example, on the tube and need to find a plug and hold it in place while we try to make a phone call. Um, so obviously, without um, power, there's not going to be any mobile phones. 
um, then also, of course, they all need to be produced. And um, the picture we saw earlier as well, there's you know tons and tons of them now, disfunct. So I think that's an issue that's usually a bit glossed over, maybe, and um, that I would like to see uh, more engagement with, maybe. Um, but also, of course, we have the whole infrastructure behind it, the whole wireless networks. We've got all the masts everywhere. There used to be quite a lot of protests against new masts going up every year, where I think that's completely gone now. Um, but there have been uh, quite a few artworks kind of dealing with the network behind it and with the wireless um, networks and cells and the kind of general electromagnetic sphere uh, and how we engage, you know, how we kind of take that for granted in, um, in our daily lives. So um, there have been projects uh, like uh, Tilanono, which is like a phone box, phone booth, and when you go inside, you have no reception whatsoever. So it's a kind of, you know, uh, reversal of what it used to be about to go into phone booth. Um, that was, I can't even remember where that one was. I think that was at ICA in 2004 for Future Sonic. Okay. Um, and then a uh, kind of similar idea, I think that one was at ICA, uh, was called Bubble Space, um, which has a jammer and you have a little device that you could buy there and you press the button and you jam the reception for everyone around you. So you can be in quiet and no one can make a phone call and have annoying ringtones around you. Uh, another one is Silver Cell, also 2004 was a popular theme that year, uh, which is a little uh, bag made of, uh, uh, I can't remember, some metal that also jams the reception. So instead of turning your phone off, you can just put it into this little bag and you have no reception whatsoever. Uh, another one, Sky, yeah, that's probably the one most of you would know uh, by Usman Haag was in 2004 in London, and he had this massive cloud of balloons, uh, helium-filled balloons, I think several thousands of them going up. Um, and they all had little uh, receivers, oh, not all of them, but some of them had little receivers with phone numbers, so you could phone up there and listen to the electromagnetic sphere. So this is kind of the opposite, not trying to block it out, but actually trying to listen to it. You know, and what, what, what does it sound like up there with all the different radiation going on? Um, and depending on how many people phoned in, the, the uh, colors of the cloud change as well. There's some nice um, footage of that online. Right, um, so we kind of looked at what devices, um, what's behind it. Um, the next question I'd like to ask is um, what art? Um, because in the kind of, say, first five years maybe of mobile phone arts, it was quite a big thing to use mobile phones for art because it was really like, what? You're allowed to leave your phone on in a gallery or in a concert space? I mean, it was still this big taboo um, to deal with. Um, and there were quite a few um, pieces dealing with that. So they tried to go into galleries, into museums, into concert halls. Thank you. For example, this one is Telephony by, um, by Tom Thompson and Craighead in 2000, and they had uh, quite a few phones on the wall, nice old school ones, and you would phone up one of them and then it would kind of automatically call up the other phones as well. So you would get this, um, you know, cascading sounds of the phones ringing. Um, and what else have we got? Of course we have dial tones. Um, unfortunately at the time I didn't actually have a mobile phone, so I was sitting in the audience being very frustrated and thought I need to get a mobile phone. Um, so I don't know if you know that one. There's another one in which uh, people that might be less known to, to, to people here uh, that was done uh, in 2003 by Ligner in Hamburg called Melody Signale. And they also put a whole load of mobile phones into the gallery. There are quite a few pictures like this. Um, and uh, they distributed the phone numbers of each of these phones in town and in clubs and everywhere um, and on the web. Um, and then they, people could phone, call these phones, all the different phones, each one had a specifically composed ringtone, and then they would record the combined sound of all those phones ringing and broadcast it, broadcast it on radio. So you could then tune into the local radio and listen to the performance. Um, so that's quite interesting to think about a kind of distributed instrument um, that people can then listen to together. Um, 
and you know you could actually during the night there weren't many people um, participating, so you could kind of figure out which number which was which sound. But during the day it was quite busy, so you know it was more like a collaborative um, experience. Um, I still didn't have a phone at the time, so I had to borrow someone else's phone. <laughs> Um, yes. Do you have a phone now? <laughs> yes. Oh, I want to show it to you. It's a very old one. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you later at what, at what point I got one. Um, right, so projects trying to go into arts institutions dealing with the kind of taboo of having phones ringing in there. Um, and, but also at the same time, people were trying to take more traditional art practices out into town. So there were kind of operas and musicals and theatre plays um, that tried to incorporate uh, mobile phones um, in lots of different ways. Um, you can look them up online, but you know they included like you had to sing the libretto of an opera while you were walking around in town. Um, or another one called Kutta, um, you had to call a call center that would tell you a story while you were walking around in town. Um, all sorts of kind of um, takes on more traditional um, art practices. Right, um, but now uh, I would like to, today we've looked and yesterday we've been dealing with pretty much state of the art new fancy phones. Um, with lots of sensors, with network capabilities, with you know everything you can dream of. Um, whereas the last 10 years, artists were faced, as you all know, with the big challenge of people having um, more one of these. So my first one was one of the, the blue one on the right, I think, uh, which someone else gave to me. Um, so the challenge is, I think, for you know, if you think about art projects that invite the audience to participate, um, to really think about what's the lowest uh, common denominator, what kind of phones will people actually have? Will they have fancy phones with all the newest function, or will they maybe have a three, four year old phone um, and still use it? Um, so, for the projects I'm going to talk about next, um, they really all just need you to be able to make a phone call or to send a text message, nothing else. You don't need a camera, you don't need the internet, you don't need a sensor, just text message or uh, phone call. And many of them actually even, they are free for people because no one is picking up the phone, for example. So you're, you know, you're making a phone call, but no one's picking up, so you don't need to pay. Um, and text messaging in many countries obviously is very cheap, so that's kind of, um, also very accessible. <coughs> so lots of different ways how text messaging and phone call have been used. Um, one of them um, has been um, as a kind of remote control. Um, that was also at Els Electronica 2001, paintball. Um, if you don't think this is art, call this number. When you call the number, you know, a blob of paint lands on the, uh, on the screen in the half cuts. Uh, Instant gratification, obviously, and it was very popular. By the end of the week, it was covered in paint. Um, <clears throat> very simple interaction. Uh, you call and uh, you get a blob of paint on there. Um, another one, early one, uh, is Blinker Lights by Carl's Computer Club. And they turned the building in Berlin into a pixel screen by having each of the windows, uh, controlling the light in each of the windows and you could play Pong on there with your phone, you could control the, the bars. And they did a more recent one where they can actually dim the windows, so you can have a, you know, have a much better screen, so to say. Um, but on top of playing Pong, you could also send a message to loved ones, so you could kind of create something like this love heart, um, and then when you were on location with your sweetheart, you could phone up and it would be shown at that moment that on the screen. Um, Another one, Sail Away, which maybe deals a little bit with the issue um, of uh, consumer trash and waste. Uh, that was in 2004, and again, uh, the phone was used as a remote control. All sorts of numbers were displayed. You can see some of them on paper in the window. Um, so it's a sh shopping window in the Netherlands with all these uh, devices in there hooked up, 
and by making a phone call and then punching in the relevant numbers, you could remote control all of these objects and they would make a lot of noise. So you were kind of orchestrating um, this, this orchestra and you could do it together with other people as well um, on the project. Okay, so um, another theme that really has been coming up a lot um, uh, obviously, and um, you've been talking about before as well as the public and private issue. Um, there have been quite a few projects trying to get the private text messages, um, the private phone calls, and turn them into something public to broadcast them in some way. Um, there have been lots and lots of them. They all do it in a different way, and they're, they're all really good projects, so please do look them up. I'm really just glossing over the projects here, trying to explain them in one sentence when all of them are obviously much more complex. Um, and I'm not, you know, just look them up and, and read how they really work. Um, so uh, on the right, you can see there's a grey box mounted on the um, on that light pole there, um, and you could send a text message to that one. That's the tool for armchair activists. So you could send you could send a message from home and still participate um, in the action. Um, in the protest, and it would be broadcast into the space. And in the picture above, that's the uh, speaker's corner project, where you could send a text message, would be displayed on that LED strip in the media center. Um, another one is as message, um, which um, has a kind of similar interaction. You send a text message, and um, your message gets broadcast into into the public space. The interesting bit here is that the speaker is in the security camera, and on the side of the security camera, the number's advertised. So you can't really figure out, uh, to start with, where the sound is coming from. And the, um, the speaker also advertises itself. So it says, please call this and this number. And then when you call the number, your, your message gets integrated into the sound. Then um, this one is also one that not everyone might know. It's a project from 2003. Um, that was up in Scotland um, in, in, in one of the forests there. And the idea was to work with the existing practice of people carving their names and their loved ones' names and love hearts into the bark of, of trees. Um, so this is a kind of slightly modern version where you don't have to hurt the trees and carve into them, but you can send a text message to these little boxes and they will display your message to other people walking around and Obviously, hopefully, your loved one will come by and be impressed um, by your message. Uh, another area that's been covered a lot um, is um, the kind of social aspect um, of people coming together in public space. And that's also something that um, Jonah and Catherine have been touching on earlier. And I think it's, you know, we, we often get this idea that um, by using our mobile phones and iPods, we're shutting ourselves off from the public and we kind of you know, we're making the space kind of more habitable for ourselves. We're warming up our, we have our own cozy bubble of music and communication and whatnot, but kind of cools down the social space for everyone else, as Michael Ball puts it. So there are projects that are trying to engage uh, more the, the social side. So this in 99 by Terry Reeve, who's with us as well in the back of the room, uh, did a project where people could call in with uh, phone boxes or with their cell phones and uh, listen to messages from the community uh, or contribute messages as well. Um, and uh, another one which is very well known, Murmur, um, that started out in Canada, but it's been done in many other cities. Um, really simple interface, you put up a little uh, plaque with the number, people can call in and listen to a story about that specific location. And then other people could also uh, record stories and add it to the space. And I think that's especially interesting because, you know, we have all this fancy geo-annotation stuff going on now and, you know, everyone is really excited about it, but it was also possible to do it really with, with very simple means um, uh, on the side of the participant. So for the audience, it's very easy to make a phone call or send a text message. Um, obviously, on the, on the back end, uh, it's always a little bit more complicated and there was a lot of work going on there. Right, um, another very early one, um, kind of more pushing the, the, the social side of it is uh, pixel kissing that was actually done in 98, 99, um, and it was part of a bigger project um, 
they were doing at the time to kind of explore um, how mobile phones might be used in the future. And uh, for this specific one, when you were in the same cell, cell phone cell as someone else that was part of the project, you would get a kiss. But you wouldn't exactly know where the person is and who the person is. So the idea was then that you could uh, look around and try to figure out who just kissed you. Um, and obviously the person would also try to look out for you because they just got a kiss as well. Um, all sounds very basic, but at the time um, I think it was quite an interesting idea also to think about the proximity in terms of the network. Um, another way which um, most of you probably know I'm quite excited about is to use uh, mobile phones as musical instruments. Um, this has been done for many years. Um, there have been lots and lots of projects. Um, and now this is the moment, Pop Horns 2007, I had my own mobile phone because I wanted to play with them. So I'm really late with this. Um, and I don't have it here, so I can't show you now. Um, so there have been, again, there have been projects that really use very basic ringtones, phone calls, text messages to make music. Um, and now we, of course, see much more advanced things. But for example, on the, on the top right, you see a mandala where you put your mobile phone with a specific ringtone in a bag on a string and you swing it above your head. Um, and you get really interesting microtones going on. Um, if you do that in a group performance, it's actually quite impressive um, what you can do with that. Um, then on the left, we have Handy Dandy in mobile for a rock band that uh, played at the mobile music workshop a few years ago. And then at the bottom, we can see the pop horns, which was a kind of loop um, application where you could record loops um, and play them on your phone, and that was really good fun. Uh, lots of other projects um, that have been presented at the mobile music workshops. Um, that I've been organizing with Atal Tanaka and Lani Agai, who's presenting later on. Uh, so if anyone is interested in the more musical and sonic side of, of mobile technology, we did this uh, little book, which I have with me, only one copy, unfortunately, but you're welcome to have a look at it. Um, and um, yeah, so there have been lots of things going on. So um, now I would like to ask, how new is all of this? I mean, in 10 years um, of mobile phone arts and of also of more about music making, and um, now it kind of seems, even now it seems quite new. A lot of people are playing the ocarina on their iPhones and the leaf trombone. I think there are like two million people doing it now. It's very popular. Um, and you know, we think, wow, this is amazing. We can play music on a telephone, and other people can listen to us while we are playing. And um, you know, it doesn't only use the phone; it uses the entire network. So it's really kind of magic and new and press is really excited. Um, what I would like to say now is that maybe some of these things are not as new as we like to think they are. This is more than a hundred years ago. And this is a musical instrument that uses the telephone and the telephone network to make music, to distribute the music. And it's called the Telemonium. And uh, it's an amazing piece of engineering at the time, a massive machine. Um, really intriguing and it's interesting because at the time they didn't have any other means for amplifying sound than the telephone system. So um, when uh, Cahill, the guy who invented it, wanted to make a musical instrument, he only could use the telephone system. So he's amplifying the sound via the telephone system um, and then um, people could listen to it in remote locations. So that was before radio, that was before the amplifier, before lots of things were invented. So I, I'm quite uh, impressed with this. Um, and the idea is that people would be at home and listen to this music, and you could have different channels with different music, and uh, hotels would have it as a kind of mosaic. And um, eventually they also built a hall, the Telemonium Hall in New York, and people would go there and listen to this amazing electronic music uh, being played. And the press, again, was all about magic, new, and amazing. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that a lot of the, the press coverage and the excitement is very similar to what's happening now with, with the uh, iPhone Ocarina. Um, with this, I would just like to invite you to also look you know, beyond what is exciting now, look at the past.
kind of 10 years of what's been happening with mobile phones, but also maybe look beyond that and get kind of into the deep time of the media, as Zelensky puts it, or as Mujamo says, to do a little bit of media archaeology and to see what else has been going on. Is there been, especially with mobile technology, mobile media, there have been so many projects, you know, in the 20s and 30s that are really lost because somehow media scholars never bothered to put them into the history of media. It's always about film and, you know, radio and all those kinds of things. But if you dig it up around a little bit, they're amazing things. People made their own headphones and made their own receivers they could wear on their head while they were doing the gardening so they could listen to music and, you know, different ways how uh, radio used to be used and telephones used to be used. And a lot of those things we're coming back to now with, with mobile phones. Um, so I would really uh, encourage you to have a look at that. Um, and um, something else, coming back to now, jumping back 100 years, or a little bit more maybe. Um, now we think about uh, using mobile phones mainly in an urban environment, and maybe in a kind of Western or Asian environment. Um, but of course, mobile phones um, are also used here, you know, when we go on a hike or we do geocaching or all sorts of things, we use it in the countryside. Mobile phones are more and more, and I think mainly used now in developing countries. There are all sorts of interesting applications for checking how safe your medication is, um, for checking crop prices, um, and you know, there's really a lot of leapfrogging going on. I mean, if you went to the Java talk yesterday, um, you were saying that, for example, in Brazil, you cannot file a tax application on paper anymore. You have to do it uh, online. And obviously, most people don't have computers. So most people do their tax uh, tax return on the mobile phone. It's just things you know, that you can't even do here that uh, are happening um, all over the place. So um, I just wanted to challenge a little bit of what we think of as an audience for mobile phone arts. You know, usually we think about kind of young, urban, techie crowd. Um, but I would say that, you know, so many other people out there um, that we often forget about. Um, and there are so many other projects also going on in these countries that are often very difficult to, to document um, and to find. So keep your eyes open um, for those projects. Um, and um, that's it. Thank you very much.